George Carlin seven words. If you want to curse in Yiddish, that is allowed. I'm sure Joel is an expert on that, but none of the, uh, the F words or anything like that. But we are going to, we usually sign off here. I want to remind everybody that next week we're meeting on Sunday, not Monday. And we will have a national launch of a grassroots campaign to keep, to get control, uh, to fight, uh, to, to have dem democracy at our local state, our local, not only our local station boards at Pacifica, but also at the local uh, uh, election boards throughout the country. So Joel, you can proceed. We are gonna continue uh, with the recording of this because this is important stuff. And uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for en engineering up to this point and Steve Hurst for taking it over and keeping the recording going. All right, Joel, you're back on, go yeah, ahead. And I, I, I've spoken to senior Judiciary Committee staffers about this idea. They of course said, no, you can't do it. Uh, states have the purview over election laws. I understand that and I get that, but as an activist, you know, I, I, I believe there are just times when you got to, with the use of law, I'm sure there will be people when I finish are gonna say that, you know, that this is, you know, not possible, it's not feasible. And, and I welcome that debate. However, we are in a national emergency. The national emergency is millions of people who are mainly black are going to be suppressed in terms of being able to vote. Biden, who was elected primarily because of the black vote, has to show black voters and young voters and progressive voters that he means business about pushing back against what I call the new Confederacy, who are hell bent on stealing elections and especially on how they count the vote. And there's a bill, a bipartisan bill that's about to be introduced. Romney is part of that, Mitt Romney, which will deal with um, putting some kind of firewalls between state legislatures and local boards of elections so they can't replace Democrats on the board of elections with Republicans, which they're doing with surgical precision of mainly um, black board of elections officials, which is you know, something that I feel like would have been done, you know, by Putin or Mussolini. Um, Biden is going to have to be presidential. He's going to have to show that he means business. And I think the executive order should be as follows. The executive order is that in order to preserve the union, in order to preserve democracy and the chair's right to vote, and to ensure that the 1965 Civil Rights Amendment um, is adhered to, I am issuing an executive order saying that all election protection and voter suppression laws are hereby null and void. And I will do everything in my power as president if I see violations of voting, and that includes bringing out the National Guard. We are in a civil war. Make no bones about it. This is not ideological and really political. It's a civil war by the new Confederacy that basically would like to secede from the nation and not follow federal law. We've gone back to Jim Crow. So if Biden does this, will he be criticized by Fox News and Tucker Carlson? and some corporate Democrats, yes, but you know what? Who cares? I think the majority of Americans would, would get behind him. Now, let's go back to Dorothy's point. Would the Supreme Court try to uh, overturn it? Of course they would. Who cares? Now, the Congress also has the power to pass a law uh, nullifying the executive order, and the president has the power to veto it which is good news. I think it needs to be done on all the levels that I've suggested. Um, I'm finished, I welcome any comments. I'm sick and tired of the right wing rolling over um, sacrosanct federal laws that protect black people's right to vote. And, and black people are more sick and tired than anybody. They were very angry that Biden took one year to finally make a speech on voter suppression. I know why he did it. I think he did it because he knew ultimately that you'd have to carve out 
a filibuster exception, and he knew that that would anger um, Cinema and Mansion, and which is exactly what happened. He want he didn't want to risk the Build Back Better plan not being passed because of that. Um, you know, if I say if I would, here's my question to those listening: If not an executive order, then what? And then if the executive order um, if there's, you know, energy in the Supreme Court and the grassroots to nullify it, we've got to start employing the tactics of Martin King and Mandel Gandhi. We can't forget them, and we are forgetting them. This is where I'm a big believer in nonviolent civil disobedience, where we take over buildings, block streets, um, work the Congress, of course, but we're going to have to go back to the tactics of the 60s and the 70s because that, the only thing the right wing understands is power. And then also we need black athletes, black entertainers. I remember, I, I, you know, I'm old enough. Okay. No, no, Dorothy, we got to wait. We got to go in order. Do, do, do. I, I'm old enough to remember when Jim Brown and Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar did press conferences against you know racial discrimination and laws that were being passed but there there has to be a new strategy and then I'll close by saying that Dorothy is 100% right about not um you know the problem with money and the nonprofit world I'm I'm now back into the nonprofit world as the director of a national campaign to end homelessness and the this turf and competition for foundation grants is making me sick. The only way to circumvent that would be for the 1% left and progressive donors to challenge progressives to unify by giving them all money. That's the only way it'll happen. Anyway, thank you very much. Beautiful statement, really very powerful. I, I, I'm totally um, uh, uh, in awe of what you, you have said here. Uh, Dorothy, he did mention you. so. Jump on in, then we're going to go to Art Levine and Steve Rosenfeld. I just, there's an emergency for COVID. OSHA yeah. issued an order. They over they overrode it immediately. We're, the Democrats don't pay attention to the Supreme Court, and now they're paying the price. They let RBG sit there with two kinds of cancer. And yes, and we're also... Now. If the, if the Democratic Party wants to win this election, they have to stop fucking around. Excuse me. They have to stop playing around, <laughs> and they have to they have to start getting out in the streets and organizing people and signing up voters and making sure that their ballot applications are correct and driving them to the polls and doing everything that needs to be done to get these votes counted. And they need to be sitting there and observing, like the Republicans would do when the Democrats are counting. We need. There was an article that said we need the Democrats are going to have to spend some money now, and they need to spend their money on elections. They need to stop spending money on these ads that nobody listens to because the consultants can get a kickback and they're all getting rich and we're losing elections and we're losing our democracy because of the of the, of the third way and all these idiots. And then right. you got what's his face that idiot James Carville on TV blaming progressives. <laughs> Give me a break. These people have wasted our money. I wouldn't give a dime to the Democratic Party if someone held a gun to my head. Give money to PDA. I think PDA is the umbrella organization we all need to support. Joel, you need to get your rich guys to give it to PDA. PDA can distribute it to the, to the people under its umbrella. And we need to get this going. And I'm just disgusted. We can all talk about executive orders and Biden. We, you can blame us all on Jim Clyburn. Jim Clyburn wouldn't have turned black voters away from Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders would have won West Virginia. And then Joe Manchin wouldn't be sitting there so high and mighty because he would have to go along with but Bernie. We also need to point out that none of this would be happening in the Senate if the Democrats had given DC statehood, which they easily could have done. That's another first, thing. First two years of Clinton's And I just wonder whether Bernie first... would have won West Virginia, which would have taken all the air out of Manchin. Right. And, and uh, uh, both Clinton and Obama had more than ample opportunity to get D.C. statehood. It would have been 52 to 50, and none of this with Manchin and Senate would be going on. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, and uh, we're going to go to Art Levine and then Steve Rosenfeld. 
and then Lynn Feinerman. Go ahead, Art. So, Joel, uh, just to, some feedback. I also posted a number of articles that are very useful to fire everyone up. By a number of people worth looking at, and also just mentioning uh, Bryn Tannehill's article about what a post-democratic America, if Trump is to take over by 2025, would look like uh, because of our knowledge of Hungary and Poland. I would urge you to look at it. But in terms of your ideas, just a general thing is, um, uh, one is uh, Steve is coming up next. I hope he writes on some of these ideas and, and whatever he has to say, because he does have a voice and people do pick up his word. But in addition, I think um, even, I think it's worth considering selling some of your ideas to influentials in the progressive media and the progressive uh, space like Mark Elias or Ari Berman and others. Secondly, Ooh. there's existing podcasts right now that have a few million people listening periodically. That includes Gaslit Nation, that includes J J Sexton's Muckrake, uh, Muckrake um, podcast. I kind of know Andrea Chalupa a little bit, wow. but what I'm saying is, is that that the podcast world is open to a lot of progressive ideas. And if you figure out influential people and then figure out how to get the attention of producers or hosts uh, via your network or other people's networks, it's worth doing because that helps seed these ideas. So if you have a pitch or the other thing is you're creating an article somewhere you know, whether it's Common Dreams or Medium or, uh, you know, Reader Supported News about these ideas, put them down there. That allows it to be shared and then also creates a predicate for you getting on in the app. But the goal would be, unfortunately, you know, Mark Elias is essentially the uh, lead lawyer brought on all the time on voting rights. And we are in this extremist emergency that it's possible to sell him or other credible people in the existing progressive media ecosphere. Okay. And that's okay. why we so need to, that's, that's why, why we need to those are my it. ideas for you. Okay. Great ideas, Arthur. Thank you. Let's talk offline about yeah, that. So please, email me with your phone, please email me with your phone number again so we can directly talk. Okay. Okay, okay man. And Joel Thank and you, Arthur. The process of uh, producing an article, uh, advocating this and, um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get it out there. I do want to mention uh, my own history in the United States is just coming out. If anybody wants a copy of that, please email me and I'll send you the PDF. And it does talk, touch on these issues. Uh, we're going to go to people who haven't spoken yet. Uh, Steve Rosenfeld and then Sluggo. Sandy Sheila Sluggo. Dooley. Sluggo, sorry, it's Danette. Can we just go ahead and make sure everyone keeps their comments to about 30 seconds? We have yeah. a lot of people on stack. That'd be great. There are a lot, and it's, which is good. It's great, actually. Steve, go ahead. Steve Rosenfeld. And then we'll, we'll go yeah. to uh, Sandy, Sheila, Julie. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, hi, thanks. So I want to respond to some of what Jill was saying um, to keep it focused there. I'll try to be really succinct. So yes, tomorrow we'll know whether we'll see, there'll be no Republican support for the Voting Rights Act for probably the first time um, in, in decades, many decades. That will be a threshold moment. If you wanna take a look at where there's the most action, where, where literally power is being targeted and things are being done, I, I think this conversation is missing, quite frankly, where those places are. On our side, the side of pro-participation, the only thing that has been going on and building since January 6th has been the Justice Department prosecutions. And, we, there is nothing that is comparable. Hundreds of people are gonna be going to jail. Now, what's happening on the other side? Well, you have the legislatures, the, the, the Trump-led Republican red state legislatures rolling back you know, the, or complicating or bureaucratizing the key, key decision points in the process. And what are we doing? We're not doing that. We're, we, there is nothing on our side that I can see that is the equivalent of Steve Bannon recruiting people to be poll moderators or, or rather observers. Now, this is a really interesting distinction. In 2020, in the summer, there was a national poll worker shortage and a lot of groups came together 
and were able to get, recruit hundreds of thousands of people. And this was, you know, when, when it wasn't really clear that people were going to be voting by mail in the volumes they did because of the pandemic. So where is that right now on our side? Because if you're a poll worker, you have the, the, the force of local law on your side as an administrator of the process. If you're a heckler and you're an observer and you act out of line, then you could be told to leave by, by sheriffs and things like that. So I'm just saying like, where's the power really you know, in play and where's the focus and where's the action? And I just think on our side, we're kind of missing it a little bit. I also think we're underestimating what the Justice Department is doing. You know, you mentioned Mark Elias. Mark Elias is not a reliable friend of progressives. And worse than that, his last lawsuit for the Voting Rights Act gave the Supreme Court an opportunity to roll back Section 2, Section 2, which it did. And he was, this is from Arizona, and he was told not to file that suit. And the reason that he filed th that, that the Justice Department is doing what they're Even? doing. Yes, just, just let me just finish. Let me just okay. finish. And, and then okay. what they're doing is they're not trying to follow the same trap that Mark Elias followed. He's not Thurgood Marshall. He does not know when to not sue. And, and the last thing I wanted to say very, very quickly is, 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 is this. Joel, you're on the Hill. I'm hearing all this chatter right now today that people are working to rewrite some kind of a bill that will pass. That's the reason Stacey Abrams wasn't in Atlanta. I heard she and Manchin are working on something. There was an article out this morning by some fellow on the Hill, their editor in chief, talking about their discussions. What are you hearing and what are we likely to see there? That's, that's like now, today. Steve, let me jump in and say you're 100% right. Uh, and the, the reason there's no action is because the Democratic Party is what it is. And next Sunday, we're going to start the process, hopefully, of, of a national campaign in coordination with Andrew Miller and Ray McClendon and Jennifer Roberts and all the other great people uh, to, to get people into the election boards to counteract what Steve Bannon has very clearly laid out. You know, we now refer to him as Voldemort um, to, uh, uh, you know, put his people in to the election boards and prevent a fair election from happening. We are got you, and I'm glad you recollected what happened in 2020. We need to organize people now, especially young people, to get in there to the election boards and to counteract uh, these thugs and thieves that, that Bannon is putting in at the grassroots level. So that's next Sunday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, and that, that that's hopefully where, where our launch will be. And Steve, I hope you'll be a part of that discussion. We are going to do uh, three weeks after that, hopefully, uh, another and every three weeks uh, to continue this until we get enough people to counteract exactly what you just described, which is this blitzkrieg on the election boards and the election process. Joel, did you want to jump in on that? Can, can I just have one, 60 seconds? <laughs> go ahead. Go, go, go. Yes. Go ahead. Who is it? <laughs> Okay, we're jumping, Sandy, we're jumping the line here. Lynn was next. Can we keep in line, please? Wait, I just have a question. <clears throat> I just look, have a look. question for Joel. And that is, if Biden did an executive order, how long would it take the Supreme Court to be able to strike it down? What would be the process? That, that is a great question, Lynn. Um, I'm... <laughs> I hate to say it, but probably be pretty quick. Um, Ten minutes. But it, I'll, I'll do some. I'll do some research on that. I mean, we know they've got a conservative majority, so there would have to be. Usually, what would happen is I would think Arthur might be able to help with this question, but I would think it would be probably a gov a governor of a Republican state or a series of governors would do the the lawsuit, and then you know. Justice Roberts would have to, he would have to say, all right, we're going to hear this. We're going to expedite this because they got so many other cases on the docket. Now, what we would have to do is begin organizing massive protests in front of the Supreme Court on the scale of Tiananmen Square. And that's, you know, I, I would call it occupy the Supreme Court. Yeah. Could and, we and manage why, to do that through um, uh, November of 22? You think that we could, and if he did an executive order, that at least it could buy us until the end of this year? Yeah, I mean, 
But what it does is it, it garners press coverage, it'll excite the grassroots, it'll, it'll serve as an incredible education tool because I posit that most people in America, if you don't read MSN, I'm sorry, if you don't watch MSNBC or read The Guardian or The New York Times, I don't think the majority of American people understand the danger of these voter suppression laws. So it would also be an incredible organizing and educational you know, tool. Would, would Biden do it? He would only do it if we made him do it. We'd have to pressure him. I think Arthur's idea is a great idea, which would be to get as many high profile lawyers. We'd have to get some senior Democratic Party operatives who are on the left to sign a letter to him First, you'd have to have the lawyers making the legal case, and you'd have to spend a lot of time quickly getting as many people as we can who are so-called, I don't like the word dignitaries, but that's just the way, you know, press works and, and, and people in government to say, we're, at, we're demanding that you do it, especially uh, Black leaders and leaders of color. Okay, then they're going to have to go on the media. Yeah. We're at the top of the hour. I want to emphasize that, you know, this is a theoretical that get the uh, executive order, we wanted to raise the issue, but what's tangible is getting people into the election boards. That's 100% a, a go. We have to do that. We will be discussing that January 23rd, which is next Sunday, not next Monday. And uh, we will have a, uh, a, a 20 people uh, uh, who are gonna present, and then hopefully we'll be able to do it three weeks after, but that has to happen. We have to get people into the election boards. We don't have to wait for Joe Biden or the Democratic Party uh, to do that, that has to happen. Steve, if you can't stay, we can turn off the recording, uh, but uh, we have a lot of people with their hands up. I do wanna make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak before we go. Can you stay with us at least uh, long enough for that? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and if you, it's up to you if you wanna continue the recording. Um, um, and um, Julie Weiner, Wiener. Oh, thanks, um, I, I just, yeah, I just wanna urge people not to concede the, uh, lying talking point of the far right. They claim that the cons that this is a takeover, that the vote and that protecting voting rights is taking over states' rights to legislate their elections. In fact, uh, the U.S. Constitution quite clearly states that legislatures do have the right to determine the time, manner, and place of elections, except that Congress can um, rescind local voting laws that pertain to the, the time and the manner of election of senators and Congress people. That's article one, section four, I believe, article of the constitution. Uh, Joel, I don't know in front of me. Joel, you have a legal finger up? Yes, um, it's very clear in the constitution, the federal government and the Congress has the final authority on elections. It's not the, that's a big, um, the right wing likes to obfuscate and confuse everyone on this issue. It's, the states have limited powers. The federal government has the power to regulate elections, but if there's a violation of the constitution, the 1965 Civil Rights Act is now part of the constitution. You can enforce it through federal action and by executive order. It's real simple to me. It's just that there has to be passion behind Biden to do this. He's an institutionalist. He won't do it unless he's pushed. Thank you. Uh, Sue Dorfman. Thank you, Julie, for that. Much appreciated. Sue well, Dorfman, you haven't spoken yet, Sue. And then yeah, my reason. Uh, yeah, no, just very quickly. I want to back up all the things that Stephen Rosenfeld said. I think that there's a lot that gets missed um, when progressives talk because it becomes very much of an us them. And I spent today in Washington DC photographing the Deliver for Voting Rights march across the, uh, the Frederick Douglass Bridge and then at a press conference where an extraordinary number of people spoke about the importance of passing the Voting Rights Act. The reminder that if it doesn't pass this time around that it will eventually pass using the analogy between uh, what happened with the start of crossing the bridge back in Selma, Alabama, and people were saying, no, this was never gonna pass. 
um, and ultimately it did pass. Um, one of the things that I heard coming out very clearly was the importance of really speaking about how the voting real rights acts really are for everyone. It's not just for one particular side that everybody benefits for it, and it's for our children's children's children. Um, the granddaughter of Martin Luther King, uh, Yolanda Renee King, is becoming an extraordinarily eloquent speaker. She has the voice to be able to reach out to the younger generation if you have the ability to hear what she has to say. It is critically important to say, but I guess my closing words on this one really are that the more we demonize the other side, the more the other side is not going to be wanting to be part of the voting rights um, passing of the Voting Rights Act. The more that it is really heard that the Voting Rights Act benefits everyone and that it is really up to all of us to get out there and work the polls, to get out there to vote, to get out there and run for office, to get out there and fund the people that are running for office that support our values. That's what's gonna make a difference. Thank you so much. And again, I wanna emphasize, we're having the, uh, a meeting on just that next week on Sunday. I hope everybody can join us. And Sue, we look forward to seeing your photographs at some point. We can make a, an arrangement, hopefully to get them on the uh, on this call. Um, I have a reason, uh, Julie, uh, Wiener, did you want to say something in addition or is your hand just residually up? Sorry, I'll pull it down. Oh, okay, no problem. Amaya? Yeah, uh, yeah unfortunately, there, there was a woman, Sandy, uh, who okay, yes, yes. wanted to speak and she had to leave the call. So hopefully she'll have an opportunity uh, during our next call. Okay. But, but what I, uh, I just wanted to point out that, you know, we used to have uh, people stand up and talk in order to filibuster in the in the United States Senate, and now they can just threaten a filibuster, and um, and so bills aren't even introduced because of the threat of a of a filibuster, which now you know it's just become so corrupt that it only takes uh, you know it it just takes that whisper to remove legislation. I want to apply that to the idea of a, an executive order that would immediately be trumped by the Supreme Court. It, it, it seems pretty analogous that if we allow the threat of the Supreme Court overriding uh, an executive order, then we're not uh, uh, understanding the power even in the attempt to, for example, have an executive order that upholds voting rights. And if it's done with enough fanfare, so what? Let the Supreme Court put it on hold within 24 hours. It will still, um, at the very least, um, amplify our and, and um, bolster our case for reform of the Supreme Court. And it will show more and more people that the Supreme Court as presently constituted is an illegitimate court. So that it really shouldn't stop us from doing the right thing, even though we know that the outcome won't necessarily be uh, immediate voting rights, at least we'll be publicly making the case that, uh, that it's really important for the president of the United States to at least try, try to uh, protect voting rights for all citizens. Thank you. Totally with you on that. Um, I appreciate it. So we're at 408. Uh, I'm gonna take, if you wanna um, speak before we sign off, please raise your, your hand in the chat. Please remember we're reconvening um, and to talk specifically about getting people into the election boards next Sunday, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. Jeffrey, uh, Eric, and Dorothy. Go ahead, Jeffrey, real quick. I'm still waiting for that book, for that PDF on the on your book. Okay, I'll send it to you. Thank you. I emailed I, it a long, I, I while ago. Anybody else wants a PDF of the People's Spiral of U.S. History, uh, email me at solartopia at gmail, and I will send it to you. Uh, uh, Dorothy, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, Eric, then Dorothy, then Justin. Eric Lazarus, you haven't spoken today. Um, hey, um, Joel, I have a, is Joel still here? Yeah. Um, oh. Um, this is kind of especially a question for Joel. Um, so what if we were to actually say um, that by executive order, 
um, we're um, we're going to try to reestablish the voting rights that were in place for 60 years, um, and that if the Supreme Court tries to overthrow it, constitutional crisis, we're still going to enforce it. Um, screw them, right? I mean, this is stuff that's been in, it was law for how could right. it be suddenly unconstitutional for fuck's sake, right? I mean, like you don't have an army Supreme Court, voting rights you don't get to overturn. I mean, that's that's just, I mean, we'll let you win on lots of other things, but not voting rights. Does that make any sense? Eric, I mean, I, constitutional law, what, what do you think? You're right on, man. I mean, the Supreme Court just said that if you're a business over 100 workers, they've nullified COVID vaccinations as a mandate. What in the hell? I'm glad I can curse now. What in the hell is the Supreme Court?